Let's move on to stroke risk. So, okay, uh, this is bad. Um, in this T, you can see the left atrial appendage over here, and there's a, a kind of a scary looking thrombus right over there. You also see a lot of smoke, and these are associated with stroke. Um, the um, strategies to prevent patients from having this kind of stuff happen uh, involve uh, anticoagulation uh, or doing something about that appendage to make it impossible mechanically for, for a clot to form there. And that includes procedures like the Watchman procedure, which has now uh, been out for uh, a year and a half, the Lariat procedure, which has been out for several years, and the surgical atroclip uh, procedure, which has also been out uh, for a long time. Selecting the right strategy really is, uh, is the, the key. Um, but it's important to know uh, that there are options. And many people are, are really not even given these options. So assessing the stroke risk is, is the first step. Um, the chas 2 vasc score is really the, the, the nowadays the gold standard. Uh, as you'll know, uh, you get a point for each of the following uh, history of heart failure, hypertension, age, uh, two points if you're older than 75, one if you're older than 65. A prior stroke or, or, or TIA gives you two points. Vascular disease, including coronary disease, uh, and then being a, a woman. And the, when you tally up those points, uh, the, the higher the score, the higher the thromboembolic risk, and the largest thromboembolic risk is for ischemic stroke. Um, one thing about this scoring system is that if you get a score of zero uh, with a chas de vasc score, you really are in a very, truly low risk group, a, a better group than, than a CHADS 2 score zero. Group. And, and those patients really probably could be treated with nothing at all, no aspirin, no anticoagulation, or, or worse, maybe a base aspirin. These patients with a chest of S score of one, um, the guidelines will suggest that those patients should be on either an aspirin a day or a no aspirin. Um, uh, one of the novel we'll talk about. Uh, aspirin reduces your risk uh, on a yearly basis by about 25%, and any anticoagulation strategy or the watchman strategy roughly decreases the risk by 75%. So the benefit is higher if you're, uh, if you're a higher uh, chas vasc score. Warfarin, uh, the evidence for warfarin is extremely clear uh, from Pittsburgh and from older trials. Uh, warfarin is better than placebo. That probably doesn't need any more said about it. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, Dabi Gatran was the first of the uh, NOAX to come out and uh, basically uh, clearly seems to have a uh, non-inferior or better uh, stroke prevention profile than warfarin. Um, Rivaroxaban, uh, similarly, appeared to be certainly non-inferior and possibly better than uh, warfarin for stroke prevention. And interestingly, that's for all strokes, the um, benefit of most of these drugs for preventing ischemic strokes, thromboembolic strokes, when compared to Coumadin, they were about the same, actually. But the no NOACs, in general, are associated with a lower risk of hemorrhagic stroke, leading to that, uh, that result. And Apixaban or Eliquis also seems to be uh, associated with lower stroke risk, and possibly, uh, compared to the other, all the other ones, this one actually also had a little bit lower risk of bleeding than and then we get to our uh, more interventional therapies uh, from the endovascular approaches. Uh, this is the only device that's currently FDA approved, uh, and this is the Washerman device. Uh, it's basically a plug that goes into the uh, appendage through a single vascular venous access, albeit a 14 French one. And um, these are devices in clinical trials. This is the first one for the ambulance device. All of them uh, are endovascular strategies to uh, prevent thrombus from forming inside the left atrial appendage. Epicardial strategies, um, the, the probably most frequently done is the atroclip, uh, which is done by uh, minimally invasive thoracotomy uh, nowadays mostly. And this clip essentially uh, goes over the mouth of the appendage and, and, and clamps it off. The lariat device has been approved and, and is uh, uh, a procedure done by EPs and some interventionalists where we tighten the stitch around that uh, opening to 
appendage, all uh, through an epicardial access and an endocardial access. So how do we decide what to do for a given patient? For a given patient who comes to us uh, where maybe basically they don't want to be on anticoagulation, uh, how do you choose? Um, and, it, and basically every patient has a different stroke risk and it goes beyond the chest to vast score. Uh, and so you need to individualize the therapy. And then uh, every patient will have a slightly different risk from blood thinners or from these procedures. And then some people actually have very good reasons outside of AFib to be on, uh, on anticoagulation, and those factors uh, play a role. The chads 2 vast score is nonspecific. If you have a high chads 2 vast score, even if you don't have any AFib confirmed by a device, um, your risk of a stroke, of an ischemic stroke, is much higher, and, and it goes up with a higher chads 2 vast score. Uh, and so it predicts atheroembolic and other forms of stroke. So a patient with a high chads 2 vast score may actually, uh, and sh does actually have a higher risk of stroke that would not be addressed entirely by a Watchman device or, or similar closure strategy. This illustrates that two patients, will, both with a chest vascular score of five, one is a 66-year-old, both of them are 66-year-old. One is a, a woman who's a diabetic hypertensive with coronary disease and um, has had persistent AFib for two years, actually had a thrombus in the appendage that resolved with anticoagulation. She has a much higher risk of a left atrial appendage related a, uh, cardioembolic stroke. Then uh, patient two, a 66 year old man with two prior strokes, ischemic cardiomyopathy, heart failure, known to have persistent AFib after a bypass that was cardioverted without recurrence, but who has uh, uh, extensive atheromatous plaque throughout his aortic arch. Um, that guy, you know, if you do a left atrial appendage closure, uh, but take him off of blood thinners, he's, he's, he's at higher risk of stroke than the first patient. And so um, in this study, uh, from 1998, every patient had a high risk of stroke. All of these patients got a TEE, and what they found was that 30% of these patients had uh, either a thrombus in the left atrial appendage, 10% of had um, spontaneous echo contrast of smoke that you see on TV. And 35% of those, of, of the patients that got this uh, uh, TE, had atheromatous, atheromatous plaque. If you had uh, smoke or contrast, uh, or, or uh, plaque, you had three times higher risk of stroke. If you had a plaque, you had four times higher risk of stroke. The actual risk of stroke was 18% with, uh, with thrombus, 15.8% with plaque. Warfarin reduced the risk of stroke to 4.5% if you had a thrombus, 4% if you had a thrombus plaque. The relative risk reduction of a, of a stroke was 75% in both cases. They travel together. The same patients who have AFib, who have a lot of uh, uh, car uh, cardioembolic risk factors, have uh, risk factors for complex aortic plaque and benefit from warfarin. There may be predictive ability in the of the appendage, things that we're not using that are not encapsulated in the chats to vast score. Um, morphologies of the left atrial appendage are different from patient to patient. Uh, they can be cauliflower shaped over here. They can be a little bit more of like a chicken wing or, or a wing sock. The um, patients who had a chicken wing morphology seem to have uh, one third the risk of forming uh, clots inside of it. This is all. Uh, at the level of where we're, we're working this out. It may later allow us to predict who really should get a, a closure device. The risks of being on blood thinners, uh, in general, when you compare it to all of these NOACs, uh, in the white is the uh, dabigatran, then apixaban, then Xarelto, and, and azoxaban, to warfarin, the rates of ischemic stroke are about the same. Hemorrhagic stroke seems to be lower across the board for NOACs. Have a person where you're really concerned about hemorrhagic stroke, uh, really a NOAC is, is a, always have a choice. Bleeding lists are about the same, although with a fixaban and maybe uh, 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 lower risk with a fixaban. Mortality is basically similar. So choosing between them um, is, is, uh, is probably going to prefer uh, NOAC in, in most patients. Uh, in terms of warfarin versus Watchman, there were a number of large clinical trials that investigated over 1,000 patients in total. And the sum of that data, uh, 
Watchman patients compared to Coumadin followed for stroke or, or, or uh, base. All-cause stroke was basically the same between uh, the Warfarin group and the Watchman group. The ischemic stroke rate was actually probably a little bit better for the anticoagulant uh, patients. That makes sense given everything we've said about how you can have clots form elsewhere. But the hemorrhagic stroke rate was, of course, a lot lower in the group that wasn't on anticoagulants. And so the, uh, in total, it, it sort of seemed to be uh, certainly not inferior for the watchman. All cause death was a little bit favoring, probably, or trending to favor the uh, watchman uh, patients over the Coumadin patients, probably related to the hemorrhagic stroke, which are more serious strokes than ischemic. And uh, non-procedure related bleeding, which was uh, of course a lot lower with, uh, with, uh, with uh, those patients. When you get the Watchman device, for the first seven days, um, you have procedure related bleeding in some patients because you're putting a 14 French sheath in and keeping low blood thinners. That's usually fairly easily managed. Um, for the first 45 days, everyone's on Coumadin and aspirin, and you have a, a trend towards slightly more bleeding events than patients on only warfarin. After that, for the next uh, six months, patients are basically on dual antiplatelets if you got the washerman and warfarin if you're on the warfarin group. They had similar risks. But what really uh, gets people uh, to live longer probably from the watchman is every year you live beyond that, you don't have bleeding risk from warfarin uh, if you got the watchman device. And so the curves separate. And the bleeding risk and the complication risks from the Watchman device were high in the first half of the patients in the first trial using it because people were still figuring out uh, how to do the procedure and which patients should get which size device, et cetera. Once that got figured out, the, the complication rates came down by half, and, and each progressive study or, or registry has shown a further decrease in, in uh, complications, even with mostly new operators in, in some of these uh, trials. So there's clearly benefits for some patients to be on anticoagulation. Uh, we talked about athero atheromatous plaque in, in the uh, aorta. Um, and all of that gets combined together to help us decide what's be the best strategy for a given patient. Anyone who has a thrombus already is the highest risk for a stroke. In those patients, you can't do any of these procedures. You have to give them an anticoagulant. Uh, but excluding those extremely high risk patients, the first choice is probably a NOAC. Um, warfarin's acceptable if you're already on warfarin and you've got a, a no complications and you're maintaining a, a therapeutic INR. And then watchmen should be probably reserved for people who have had bleeding issues on the blood thinners, have had a stroke on the anticoagulation, so it's ineffective, uh, or don't tolerate the blood thinners. I, anyone who's had a hemorrhagic stroke probably is better off with the watchman or, or similar device. Um, so with that, I'm going to end.